Jelani Cobb, welcome to the Daily Social Distancing Show. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to see you. Um, it is an interesting time to have you on the show because you are easily one of my favorite just thinkers. You know, there are people who, who write and there are people who think before they write. And I consider you one of those people. I really appreciate it because whether it's talking about policing or police reform, whether it's talking about politics, whether it's talking about issues of race in America, I always find that you, you, you tackle these ideas from a really interesting place. And so as America begins this new journey under a new president in a new year, my first question to you would be, what do you think about America's future as it stands right now? I think that one of the things that came out of 2020, if you can point to you know, the small number of really good things that, that did come out of that year, was the fact that we had to think about our history uh, because it was re reoccurring right in front of us, you know, so much of it. You know, people trying to overrun uh, the Capitol, uh, that called back to, for, certainly for Black people and people familiar with the history of race in this country, you know, what happened after Reconstruction and, you know, Wilmington in 1898, where white supremacist mobs uh, deposed a government, you know, because it was interracial. Uh, and all those historical things that were kind of piled up like kindling, uh, and then they just, you know, burst into flames. We had to, we had to deal with it in 2020. Right. And so I think that, you know, looking forward, I'm hopeful, but I'm cautiously hopeful, you know, that we can actually start thinking about some of the problems that we have and some of the mistakes that we made previously and yeah. plotting a way to navigate forward. Do you, do you think that there really is a way to, to escape some of the mistakes that have been made in the past? And I only ask that because I struggle with America's system being a two-party system. I feel like it's inevitable that you get another Trump. And the only reason I feel like it's inevitable is because if you have one or two choices, I feel like statistically it's more likely that people, it's gonna end up 50-50, which means one side may win again. I don't think everyone who votes Republican likes Trump, but they may like a lot of the policies that are in the party, but then that enables another Trump to come up. So do you think America can actually learn if it maintains a two-party system going forward? Yeah, I mean, well, here's the interesting thing about this when we have this conversation, which is that, uh, the founders of, the, of this country never wanted parties at all. You know, they thought that parties were going to be destructive and that would be the, the quickest way that the republic would end. Uh, and, you know, the two-party system that we have has collapsed before, it's collapsed twice in American history. And, you know, some of those dynamics were present then. Uh, and so one of the things I think we have to, to bear in mind in order to uh, best hope for avoiding that kind of situation is the reminder of how fragile democracy is. Uh, and also the fact that you kind of win big or go home. Uh -huh. you know, Republicans took a really big bet on Donald Trump in 2016. And the lesson they could take is that a demagogic figure like him could succeed, uh, could be elected you know, within particular constraints when against a specific kind of opponent. Or they could take the fact that they lost the Senate, they lost the House, they lost the White House, they lost international regard of virtually all of America's allies. Uh, we've seen 400,000 and counting uh, people die because of the mismanagement of a pandemic. Uh, and all of those things that you know could be warnings. And you're right, though. We have a disturbingly high possibility that we could find ourselves in this position again. I remember just before Donald Trump's ascendancy, the Republican Party was having a, a conversation in and around, we have to expand our tent. Do you think the Republican Party will gravitate towards a world of once again trying to actually appeal to more diverse voters? Or do you think that they've now seen that there is enough, you know, excitement and anguish and, and grievances to maintain a vote and carry on the way they've been going for the last four years? That's the big question. And the best I can tell you is that they have been confronted by this before. Uh, in 1966, you know, which was two years after the 64 election, where Barry Goldwater was just destroyed. He lost by 430 something electoral college votes. Uh, just, you know, it wasn't, if it was a boxing match, they would have stopped it in the third <laughs> round. Uh, so, uh, the, one of the report, they did a report then that came out in 1966 that said we have to expand, we have to bring different kinds of people into the party. We can't uh, go down the road of just appealing to basically angry white people who at that point were angry about the civil rights movement. But the other part of it is that 
they are really getting an increasing share of a decreasing population. Uh, about 80% of their voters are white. Uh, and white people, every single election since 1996, uh, have been a smaller share of the electorate. Uh, and so the math is not on their side. And so one of the things that you know political scientists think is that it, they may uh, make themselves into, you know, no pun intended, a minority party in the right. Race. You've always had your finger on the pulse of law enforcement, for instance. Not just criticizing police, but rather saying, hey, here's a system that's broken, here's how it needs to be fixed, and here's why it needs to be fixed. Is there a path to a world where law enforcement becomes equitable, a world where law enforcement no longer maintains its ties to what it was meant to be from the past? Sure. I mean, I think that that's possible. Uh, that the, the things that we've seen, you know, two things in particular, George Floyd uh, and that excruciating eight minute, 46 second video that we saw last Memorial Day, mm-hmm. and uh, the storming of the Capitol grounds and how many off-duty police officers were involved in that. Uh, and for people who are just kind of thinking in the knee-jerk fashion or, you know, uh, kind of accepting the slogans that, you know, the police are the thin blue line that divides us from anarchy and, and so on, that's shocking. Uh, for anyone who's actually looked at the data around policing in the United States, it really is not. The first people who ever talked to me about defunding the police, and they didn't use that language, but they expressed that idea. The first people who ever talked to me about that were cops themselves, uh, saying that they do too many things, that they're right. involved in all kinds of actions, that they're, right. they're fundamentally not trained to handle mental, mental health crises, uh, which is, it makes perfect sense. If someone's having a mental health crisis, you call the police. Right. I, you wouldn't, we wouldn't call the cops if somebody had a heart attack. You know, a heart attack is not illegal. Uh, so, you know, they show up and the situations go downhill uh, predictably. And when you're really talking about creating different kinds of structures and infrastructures in cities so that the 911 is not the only thing that you call for every single problem of every mm-hmm. shape, size, or, or orientation. And so uh, if we have a more kind of broadly based system uh, of how we manage our communities, that goes a long way to, to reducing the footprint of policing. Uh, and you know, in 1968, when the Kerner Commission report came out, uh, they said, and this is 1968, they said that we should think about creating different kinds of ways of, of uh, providing services to communities besides just police, especially right, right. communities of color. Uh, it's not new. We know, we know some of this stuff. As somebody who writes about the present and looks at it through the lens of history, what do you make of the future now? Are you hopeful at where America has gotten to now on this day? Or are you trepidatious in considering where America still needs to get to? I'm hopeful, but as I describe it, I have the optimism of a boxer going into the late rounds. (laughs) (laughs) And what I mean by that is, you know, if you haven't been knocked out yet, if you're still upright, the thing that kept you throwing punches and, and staying in the fight for this long is the thing that will bring you all the way to the finish line. Uh, and so, you know, as James Baldwin said, I have to be an optimist because I'm alive. That said, I don't think we should underestimate the scale of the problems that we're confronting. The dynamics that produced Trump are still very active in the society. The anxiety around immigration, the anxiety around race, uh, the ways in which those compound, uh, you know, the economy that truthfully does not serve many people, uh, right. uh, you know, are struggling just to get by from day to day. Uh, and the way that that has been weaponized and, and used, uh, you know, to, to fuel xenophobia and racism and so on, uh, those are very real dynamics and very real problems, and they will not be easily defeated. Uh, but I don't think that they are permanent, and I don't think that we have to always presume that we can't surmount those obstacles. Well, it's going to be an exciting 12th round. Uh, Hopefully, we get to chat to you again uh, afterwards and we haven't been knocked out. Jelani Cobb, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you.